Welcome to the Hour Has Come series. My name is Mark Rees Thomas and we're pleased to share this message with you. We have four goals for this series. Firstly, that you understand the times you're living in from the lens of the Bible. Second, that you develop an action plan in response to what you learn. Third, that you draw near to God and become a person of prayer. And finally, that you're emboldened to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Hey, have you come with expectant hearts this afternoon? Who's come with an expectant heart? You know, whenever we come into the presence of God, we should come with expectant hearts, shouldn't we? God can do awesome things on a Sunday afternoon, or He can do it in your house, around your dinner table, but when we come expecting, God can speak. And the series today that we're going to be having over the next few weeks is all about listening to God and recognising the time that we live in. And I want to welcome you to this series, which you've most likely never been to before. And I'm sure some of you are wondering why you're here and what it's all about. The subtitle for this series is A Biblical and Legal Briefing for Christians. And in this four-part series, we're going to cover some interesting topics. And I encourage you to come each week because we're going to build subject by subject over the coming weeks. We're going to start today and talk about the times that we live in. What is unique about the times that we're in right now? I'm sure you realize that they are quite unique for various reasons. Why is it important? And we're also going to cover today this interesting topic of when a nation rejects God. That's pretty full on. When a nation rejects God, and you may be surprised to discover today what that means for the world, but also for New Zealand. Next week we're going to cover an interesting topic. We're covering a, uh, having a whole session dedicated to it. And you might find it an interesting topic because it's called Lessons from the Church in Nazi Germany. That's a pretty full-on topic, isn't it, to have in a church? But if ever there was a time in history that we can learn from the church, most recent history, it's that period of time. And I think the lessons from that period of time are so important for the days that we are living in right now, and in particular in New Zealand. After that, we're going to move on and talk about the path that New Zealand is following. We're going to look at New Zealand legislation. I'm a lawyer, so I'm going to bring that perspective in. We're going to look at various bits of legislation from a moral perspective and say, what is it telling us about where this country is going? Covering topics like hate speech, conversion therapy. We're also going to cover the topic we can't not cover, the topic of where does COVID fit in the end times picture. You might think that's all we're going to talk about, but it's not. But we'll talk about it at some point. We also are going to cover this very, very important topic of the curriculum in schools. And if you're a parent or a grandparent or a soon-to-be parent, this is a very important topic, including Christian schooling. And you might think that Christian schooling is the fantastic alternative to the schooling system. We're going to explore that and ask where is it all heading? And finally, how should Christians respond in these days? Each session is jam-packed, so I encourage you to take notes, either on your phone or uh, on notepad. A well-known preacher used to say that in his teachings there was something to offend everybody. And I'm sure that that will be the case here. <laughs> Depending on your view of the Bible, you may even disagree with some of the things that we cover in the coming weeks. You may equally be surprised that when you see perhaps for the first time the reality of where things are heading in New Zealand and around the world and what that means for you as a believer. During this series you'll be faced, I believe, with some very difficult decisions to make. It'll impact on your faith, your home life, your children's schooling or their lives, your workplaces and potentially it may even impact in the future for you having to make some tough decisions personally in regard to whether you obey the Word of God instead of the law of New Zealand. Well, in this series, we're not going to tell you what to do. That's for you to make up your mind based on the information you receive and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but 
I refer to uh, uh, Dr. Chuck Misler, who passed away a few years ago, and he used to teach, and he would refer to Acts chapter 17, verse 11, and he said that whenever you listen to a preacher, you need to be like the people who are mentioned in Acts chapter 17. And this is what it says. It says, Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness, and examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. They were eager to listen, but they went away and they did their homework. And I want to encourage all of us to do that. If I stood up here today and told you that I am your single source of truth, I would encourage you to get up and to walk out that door and not return. <laughs> Need I say more? But I will say this, that saying those sorts of things is an extremely dangerous thing to say. We must be a church and a society where we encourage discussion and encourage debate and encourage people to do their own homework. You know, it's easy just to fit in and go along with what the majority believe, isn't it? In New Zealand, we have approximately 26 million sheep. Sheep are renowned for following the crowd and following any shepherd who stands up and says what they want to say, whether good or bad. But we as believers need to be different. We need to be the sheep who follow the true shepherd. Amen? Amen. And we must resolve to only follow what the Bible says, irrespective of society's shifting values. And despite watching so many churches who have elected to assimilate into the world, that's not easy, is it? But that's our calling. Well, let me introduce myself a little bit because I appreciate some of us have met, some of you have not met me, and some of you obviously watching this on uh, on video have not met me either. I'm a lawyer, and I've practiced law for about 25 years. I um, had the privilege of doing that for the last 15 years with my brother Simon, and that is partly prompted me to teach this topic, but more importantly, I'm a Christian, and I invited Jesus Christ into my life when I was about 21 years old. I grew up in a wonderful Christian home and attended a church and read the Bible, but it wasn't until I was 21 that I truly gave my life to Christ. You see, born, being born into a Christian home doesn't make you a Christian. Confessing your sins to a priest, or being christened, or saying prayers, or reading the Bible, none of that makes you a Christian. Becoming a Christian means you come to a point in your life where you say, God, I recognize that I'm a sinner. And I recognize that you came in the person of Jesus Christ, and you gave your life for me so I could be reconciled with my God. Becoming a Christian means you then say, Lord, I give you my life. I confess who I am as a sinner and I need you. And God says he promises to come and to enter your life. Have you done that? Maybe you're sitting here in this room or listening to this message and that's the first time you've heard what it really means to be a Christian. You can give your life to Jesus this very day. And that's what I did many years ago. I won't tell you how many. You can probably do the math. But I did that many years ago, and ever since I've studied the Bible, and the Bible continues to be ahead of every age that I happen to get to in every age in history. It's more current than tomorrow's news headlines, and it says this in Isaiah 46 verse 10, I declare the end from the beginning, and ancient times from what is still to come. Do you know God's not out of date? He saw it all before it happened. And we have the privilege of studying the Bible and interpreting the times that we're in based on God's prophetic time clock. And that's partly what we're going to do in this series. This is not an end time series. If it was, it would be a lot longer and a lot more detailed. But we are going to touch on aspects of it because you have to with the topics we're covering. Why are we presenting this briefing? Well, things are speeding up at an increasing pace. Have you noticed? Christians are looking for a framework to make sense of the world and to have guidance for what to do right now in their lives. 
And in recent months, I have connected with people, quite a few people who are deeply concerned with where this country is at and where the world is at, frankly, and wondering what to do and wondering where the church is at. And finally, while I hope this is not true, there is strong reason to believe that we are entering a time very soon where Christians will come into direct opposition with the world and with the laws of New Zealand to the point where not only will they be opposed, but they will be persecuted. If you're a Christian, then I encourage you to pray through this series. You know, when you go gardening, and I don't do a lot of it, when my wife goes gardening, and, and she lifts up the rocks, you know what comes out is cockroaches. You stir up the garden and the cockroaches come out. And it's the same with the forces of darkness. Ephesians 6 verse 2, 12 says this, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces in the, evil, in the heavenly realms. And I've got to tell you, without going into details and preparing for this series, we have found that to be true. Very much so. The enemy does not want this stuff spoken of. And we have covered this in prayer, and I encourage you to do the same in the coming weeks. Finally, this is not a political briefing, but unfortunately you'll see that when a country abandons God, it is the church and the nation's leadership who are accountable. And we need to pray for revival in our leadership, don't we? Revival in our government, revival in our church. We desperately need it. Well, with that introduction, you thought that was a session. No, that was the introduction. We come to session one. And session one is called the times that we live in. And we're going to be setting the framework for understanding the times we live in and how we should approach these times. The title for this series is The Hour Has Come, and it comes from Romans 13, verse 11, which says, The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. You know, when you were saved, you were called out of the tomb. You remember the story of Lazarus? How Lazarus was dead and buried. He was in the tomb and there was not a thing he could do about it. But the stone was rolled away and Jesus called Lazarus out of that tomb and gave him life. That was you and that was me before we knew Christ. We were dead. There was nothing we could do. And Jesus called our name. I love it how one person said that when Jesus called out, he, he used Lazarus' name because if he just said, come out, everyone would have come out of the grave. But that's the power of Christ that we have, right? Mm. And we were called to life. But the problem is that many of us were called to life and then we went to sleep. And we've been asleep ever since. Oblivious to the times we live in and in danger of falling for the shifting tide of morality of society. And the Lord says to each of us today, the hour has come for you to wake up. Why? Because your salvation is nearer now than when you first believed. So as we get into the series, there are four things that we're going to briefly cover that lay the platform for our discussion and to keep in mind in the coming weeks. We're going to cover the authority of Scripture and why that is important. We're going to talk about understanding the times that we live in and also what is our relationship with government. And finally, this topic that we can't avoid of persecution and suffering, which we have avoided for many, many years, but I suspect we are going to see some of it starting to come. So let's cover this first topic of the authority of Scripture. I want to be up front and say that this briefing in the next few weeks will only make sense to you if you have what I call a serious and a high view of Scripture. This means that you hold the Bible out to be the Word of God from first to last, without error, and applicable 100% to the times that we live in. And it also means that you interpret society from the lens of the Bible. You do not interpret the Bible 
from the lens of society. And unfortunately, a large portion of the church are actually dead because they're interpreting the Bible based on culture of the day. As if that's something new, by the way. So what is it about the authority of Scripture that we need to be conscious of? Well, the first thing is that people have been taught that not all of the Bible is true or is from God. You're probably aware of some churches who have decided which bits they want to pick out to say is from God and which bits are not. And I want to say that this is not a minor issue. It is a fundamental issue. You see, the moment someone chooses to form the view of what was from God and what was not from God, do you know who they're professing to be at that point? God. <laughs> it's logical. They place themselves in the place of God. I always say, open the Bible and point to me the place where God starts telling the truth. The point is, if you take one word out, one letter, you might as well throw the whole Bible out. For who are you to determine God's word? 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 says, All scripture is God-breathed. The word all there is atomus. It means, it's where we get the word atom from. It means the most minuscule bit of the scripture is God's word. Jesus also said in Matthew 5, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Well, secondly, Christians have taken God's standard of holiness and reinterpreted them based on on today's cultural values. We see that, don't we? So much of the church has gone down that path. And I want to tell you that that is a fatal error. God is holy. God is holy, full stop. He does not change over time and neither does His holiness. His holiness is absolute and is independent of any time, any culture, any society or any government. Customs change, people change, but God's holiness and His standards never do. Well, thirdly, Bible colleges and preachers have failed to take the Bible seriously. They've read large parts of the Bible as allegorical and have reinterpreted the promises that God gave to Israel as promises now given to the church and all manner of things they've done with their interpretation of the Bible, but they haven't taken it seriously. And this is an immense failure that leads to confusion when interpreting the very topics that we're going to be covering in the next few weeks. You see, when you start going down an allegorical interpretation of the Scriptures or, or other strange interpretations, you miss the whole end times understanding. You get confused about the rapture and the rule of the Antichrist and the return of Jesus Christ. And what I've found in talking to people who take these interpretations of Scripture is they have no idea of what's happening around them. They have no biblical lens. I've actually spoken to Christians about the things that are happening in the world today and they're completely oblivious. And I think it's because they do not understand the Scriptures. And this is a major problem. In 2018, the Barna Research Group conducted a survey in America and found that 51% of pastors had what is called a biblical worldview. Let me tell you what that is, a biblical worldview. It is a belief in absolute moral truth as defined by Scripture, as well as acceptance of six core biblical beliefs. What were they? The accuracy of biblical teaching, the sinless nature of Jesus, the literal existence of Satan, the omnipotence and omniscience of God, salvation by grace alone, and the personal responsibility to evangelize. Half the evangelical pastors in America do not have a biblical world view. And we wonder why Christians are confused. In 2011, Answers in Genesis CEO Ken Ham at the time conducted a survey of 200 Christian colleges, which are essentially university level. Christian colleges. And he found that 35% of those teach the Bible as true and 25% teach it as inspired by God. This was 10 years ago. But what happened this year? 
In 2020, the Barnard Research Group conducts a survey in America every few years, and, and in 2020 they did this of those who profess to be Christians. And this is what they found. 63% of those people who responded say the Bible cannot be trusted to fully represent the God-given principles. 46% believe Jesus sinned. 65% deny that the virgin birth happened. And get this, 47% of those who are in the millennial age bracket believe evangelism is morally wrong as it might pressure someone to change their faith. You wonder where conversion therapy is going? Interesting, isn't it? 20% believe the Holy Spirit will tell them to do something contrary to Scripture. And 81% believe humans can be their own moral compass because they're essentially good. Jesus spoke in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, to the church of Laodicea. And it's interesting because of the churches he spoke to, this is the only church he had nothing good to say about. Laodicea essentially means the church of people's opinions. It's Laodicea, the people, and Decea, meaning ideas, the, the church of people's ideas. The Bible is discarded, or it's just another voice. And that's essentially the church today, isn't it? The Bible is no longer the sole voice and sole accountability. 2 Timothy 4 verse 3 speaks of these days we're in with the church, and it says, The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And you know, the frightening thing about this church in Laodicea is it was the only church where Jesus was on the outside. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, he said to this church, Here I am at the door, and I knock. And we use that as a, as a beautiful verse when we're saying that God is calling sinners into repentance. And that's true, but the actual context was he was outside this church. And why was he outside? Because they discarded the word of God. And people, we must come back to reading the Bible exactly as it is and to take it seriously. And if you're prepared to do that, the days you live in will make sense. Well, what's the next topic that we need to be aware of? The second and important element of our foundation for this series is that we must be aware of the days that we live in. Matthew 16, verse 2, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for not understanding the times that they lived in. And he said this, When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy. For the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. And people, just as Jesus expected them to understand the times they lived in, he expects his church today to understand the times that we live in. I've got news for you today. We are living on the cusp of the end times, I believe. One of the true markers of where New Zealand is at concerns the moral state of the church and the moral state of the country. Isaiah 5 verse 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Did you know that our churches and our country are blatantly calling good that which is evil? And they are calling evil that which is good. And they are encoding it into legislation. New Zealand is making laws in direct contravention to the holy laws of God. Why is that happening? It's because people's desire and their sin is so great that they must pass laws to undo God's laws. And that's what we're seeing. Even Socrates commented on this and he noted this. He said, a system of morality which is based on relative emotional values is a mere illusion, a thoroughly vulgar conception which has nothing sound in it and nothing true. Even he got it. When you put God outside of how you determine morality, everything goes wrong. Well, in addition to being a Berean, 
who goes and researches the Bible, we also need to be like the sons of Issachar. Who are the sons of Issachar? Well, they're mentioned in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, and it says this, The men of Issachar who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. You know, I know a lot of people who are good Bereans. They know the Bible. They go and do their homework in the Bible. But many of these people do not understand the times that we live in. They don't have that lens as they look at the times that we live in and they dismiss the events around them, just like the Pharisees did. And our challenge today and going forward is we must be two things. We must be Bereans, but we must be like the sons of Issachar who look at the times that we live in. If your world or view of the world and, and world events does not have a prophetic lens, then you're likely to miss out on what is going on like the Pharisees did. I've heard some Christians say, you don't really believe that all the governments in the world are colluding together, did you? Well, there's two answers to that. I think there are many governments in the world who are dumb, uh, too dumb to know that they are colluding. But the real answer is, yes, there is a master plan, and there is a person who is actually leading it, and his name is Satan. And you can read about it in the Bible. <laughs> and he has a plan, and he is following it. And so as we look around, don't, don't fall to the conclusion that every leader is evil. That's not what this is about. The enemy is far craftier than that, but he has a plan. It's satanic, it's real, it's global, it's heading in one direction, it's written about in the Bible, you can read it. And if you're a son of Issachar, you'll understand the context of it. The enemy will be so crafty in the way he does it. And so well planned that Jesus warned us ahead of time and said, watch out that no one deceives you. And so what do we do? Well, we live our lives, but we keep watch. We look out and we be like the sons of Issachar and understand the times. The next topic we need to look at is one where I'll just finish now and you can make up the rest. It's called our relationship with government. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. This is, a, this is an important topic, but it's not an easy one. We need to keep it in mind as we go through the next few weeks. The primary passage that addresses this topic is Romans chapter 13 verse 1 and it says this, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. And in 1 Timothy 2 it says that we are to pray for our leaders, pray for our government. And I say it in jest, but in 2021, this is a pretty serious topic, isn't it? Mm. It's a confronting topic, not just New Zealand, but around the world. It's getting real. Now, it's important to note as we address this topic briefly today, that this obligation of honouring and submitting the authorities applies even when your government is not the one you want. Or you don't think they're particularly competent. You see, we aren't told to submit to the government only when we agree with their policies or only when we think they're doing a good job. That would be easy. But we're told to submit to them, irrespective. And that's not easy. The rub is when decisions affect your livelihood or ability to exercise the freedom that you're used to, it makes these verses very confronting. And we're going to look at this in the weeks to come because it's not a topic that you cover quickly. And it's one that will make itself evident to you as we go through. You may think that as we talk about these things, I am referencing COVID. And to an extent, that is true. Some have asked whether we'll be addressing this topic in this series. And we will be addressing it, but not from the perspective that you might think. You see, the real issue is not the virus or the vaccine, although... They are very important, and personally I have some very deep concerns about the process and the managed information that we see. But there is something far greater happening when it comes to this topic of COVID from an end times perspective. And we're going to examine it in the lessons to come. It does worry me though that so many Christians are oblivious to what is really going on right now and cannot see the bigger picture. And that's partly why we're running this series. Well, these passages of submitting to government have been used well over the years and they have been used poorly. 
And we're going we're gonna to actually dedicate next week, as I said at the start, to this topic of Nazi Germany and the church. Because in Nazi Germany and the church, you had that very specific issue of how do you address a governmental system that is in direct opposition to God. And you had two sides. You had the church that just slowly fell away from God and went along with the state. And you had a small remnant of the church that stood up. And we can learn from both perspectives, and it's a very important lesson next week. It's interesting, though, that in Nazi Germany, when a large part of the church went along with Hitler, they actually referenced specifically the verses that I have just read to you and said that we must submit to our government. And they justified turning a blind eye to the atrocities around them, given those verses. What's fascinating, though, is that when uh, the regime started to grab the, the church leaders who were opposing them and tortured them and threw them into prison, did you know that often they would quote back Romans chapter 13 to them? And they quoted this back to the church people. Because in verse 4 of Romans 13, it goes on and it says, For he, the government, is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Did you know the SS used to quote that to the church when they took them to prison and said, we are actually doing God's work. You're the ones in the wrong. You need to submit to us. We are the government. We are called to submit to our leaders, but there is a limit. And the limit stops where our allegiance to the government or our employer or any other authority conflicts with our allegiance to Jesus Christ as Lord. Amen? Amen. And we are not called to sit idly by and conform to immoral laws or laws which directly conflict with the exercise of our faith as outlined in the Word of God. And as we will see in a, in a later session, when a government has unfettered power with passionate ideology, the church is persecuted. And if ever there was a time where power is handed to a government, almost unfettered power, unheard of, it's right now. We are seeing things around the world today that three years ago you would not have believed. And the power that the governments have around this world is frightening. It happened in Nazi Germany. It's going to happen again. Proverbs 28 verse 12 says this. When the righteous triumph, there is great elation. But when the wicked rise to power, people go into hiding. You know, in the last 80 years, the Western world has lived in incredible times of peace. Which is extremely unusual in history. But times of trial will come again. And these verses that we often gloss over are going to become more real. Mm. You know, where laws contravene God's, we obey God and not man. And some scenarios are obvious. Daniel faced it. In Daniel chapter 6, you remember that Darius the king said, No one is allowed to pray to their God. They must pray only to me for the next 30 days. And we read in chapter 6 verse 10, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. And three times a day he got down on his knees and he prayed. You know, the thing that astounds me here is Daniel, despite hearing the edict of the king, did not hide his faith. He faced the situation head on and he used it as, a, as an opportunity for a testimony. In Daniel 3, Daniel's friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced a similar thing. King Nebuchadnezzar issued a decree and said, You must bow down to this idol, and if you don't, then you'll be thrown into the furnace. In Daniel chapter 3, they replied, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't have to defend ourselves before you in this matter. I love that. This is the most powerful man in the world. We will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now listen, I've thought about this a lot. Only three guys, only three guys said no. I'll tell you what a lot of the others were doing, I can guarantee it. It's not in the Bible, but I'll guarantee it. Many of them said, listen guys, 
There's no point getting, you know, stir fried for this. What if we just bow down, but in our hearts, we're praying to God? That wasn't good enough for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They knew that wasn't right. They chose not to compromise. Why do I mention that? Because, and it's a sensitive topic, but in New Zealand, it's very commonplace now to offer up an indigenous prayer or a blessing in workplaces and in meetings. And I want to say to you, be very, very careful. Know what is being said. Some of them are harmless. Some of them are simply just nice things. But some of them are prayers to God's. Be very careful what you're doing. And ask yourself how Daniel and his friends would have reacted. In Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were also ordered not to preach the gospel. And Peter and John replied, Judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. You know, if you're placed in a Daniel situation, it's a no-brainer. But the challenge for us is what about those less direct situations that creep into our workplaces and into the laws of New Zealand? At what point do we say, you know what? The answer is no. This is contravening my faith. This is contravening the Word of God. And no matter what that means for me personally, I don't know, but all I'm going to say is the answer is no. You won't be the first person placed in that situation, and you won't be the last, and you might find it comes at a lot of cost. And with that, we move on to the next topic and the last part of our foundation, which is this question of persecution and suffering. You know, in New Zealand, it's not something we've had to encounter to any meaningful extent. Our persecution muscles, I must admit, are pretty weak. And yet, most of the church over the past 2,000 years has experienced persecution. And Jesus said the church should expect it. Let's just read some verses that explain it. Philippians 1 verse 29, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. 1 Peter 4 verse 12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. And if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Matthew 24, you'll be hated by all nations because of me. And John 15, <clears throat> if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. The famous German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who we will hear about next week, who stood up for Christ in Nazi Germany and was hung for it, said this, when God calls a man, he bids him come and die. Suffering is not an interruption, but our calling. Bonhoeffer was 40 years old when he was hung for his faith, but he left behind an enduring legacy because he stood up for the name of Christ. Well, although suffering is bound to come, we must keep the right perspective. <laughs> Because as persecution comes, there is also immense blessing in the persecution. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 9 that when we are persecuted, we are not abandoned. God will never abandon us in the persecution. Others might, but he won't. In John 16 verse 33, Jesus said, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In 1 Peter 1 verse 7, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. You know, in the book of Revelation, Jesus wrote to a church called Smyrna. And the, the church of Smyrna was known as the suffering church. They went through immense suffering. And just as Jesus had nothing good to say about the church of Laodicea, he had nothing bad to say about the church of Smyrna. You see, Jesus is close to those who suffer for his name. And you get closer when you suffer for his name. Are we ready for it? No. 
Am I ready for it? No. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32, gives us a model of suffering. It says, Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution, and at other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. It goes on and says that these people lost their possessions and did it willingly. Are we ready? If we're honest, I'd say we're probably not. But God wants to use this series, people, to call us and wake us and put us on fire so that whatever we have to do, we do. Well, as we finish this introductory session, let's consider the following hypothesis and then take up a quick challenge. This is not a prophecy, but it's an assessment of where things are heading based on where we're at. The hypothesis is that we are at a significant turning point in society and in the church right now. When I was thinking about running this series, I said to Janine that I have to do it quick because I can't keep up with what's happening. And I believe we need to wake up and we need to wake up fast. And this trajectory is progressing to a point where freedom to practice our faith will be significantly impacted in the next few years. If I had said that to my grandparents, they would have been astounded. The fact that I'm even mentioning that to us today is astounding. But it's true. And we will soon see increasing restrictions on our freedoms in New Zealand. All of what we encounter will be sold to us on the basis that it's in the name of tolerance, inclusion, people's rights, and the greater good. And my challenge for us today is that we stand back from everything we know, and we put on the glasses of the Word of God when we view the world and the church. We become Bereans and we display the characteristics of the sons of Issachar. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 says, The end of all things is near, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. You know, the greatest challenge we all have is not just to recognize the times that we live in, but to do something about it personally. And I find it amazing. If I had written this verse, I would have said, The end of all things is near, therefore go and buy a lifestyle block, look after yourselves, whatever it might be. That God says, be clear-minded and self-controlled. Why? So you can pray. Really? God, isn't there things to do? Like, isn't praying kind of a little bit? Like, don't we need to do something different? God says, no. I need you to be a praying church. And when you're a praying church, you'll be a powerful church. But if you're not a praying church, you'll be a fallen church. And so the challenge for us as we finish this session is we're... Where are you at personally? Where is your walk with God personally? Are you a person of prayer? If you're not, you're going to fall for the times that you live in. So with that, we bring this first session to a close. That was a pretty heavy session, right? You think that was heavy. Wait for the second session and the third session. It just keeps getting heavier. 